I came to the church was, okay, it being a church overseas, there's not much you can do overseas, you know, especially being in a remote location. And so I got to know some people on the base fairly well. One guy in particular kept asking me, you know, why don't you come to church with me? I'm getting ready to join this church. Would you come watch me join for moral support? And that was the first time I came to that church. And that was when the Lord really spoke to my heart. And that's when I had my experience. We were new in Germany. And um, prior to us arriving in Germany, I had just graduated from college. My husband joined the military. Mm -hmm. And we learned we were going overseas. When we went overseas, just felt lost. And um, had a co-worker who was in the church, and she invited us to, um, I think they were having a, the pastor's the anniversary, anniversary, Bishop Lee's anniversary. So Joseph White was teaching about heaven, and heaven was a planet. And I immediately said, my friend Sheila, I said, oh, she, she has me in a cult, <laughs> because who talks like that? Baptists don't talk like that. But I kept listening, mm -hmm. and he went to the scripture, mm -hmm. and the way he explained it, I, it, it wasn't far-fetched, but it was the first time that I heard that heaven was real to me. Mm -hmm. You sing about it, and you grow up talking about it, but now it was really real to me. I was invited. Mm -hmm by a man that became my first pastor mm -hmm. in the Church of Living God International. I worked with him. Mm -hmm. I was going through some things in my life, mm -hmm. going through some marital situations. So I would go to him and pick his brain, mm -hmm. ask him about this, ask him about that. And then I would say as the Lord started dealing with me and my wife, he had an answer for everything. Well, my dad was in the Air Force, okay. so that's where he was stationed and um, that was the church they were going to. And I remember my mother being in the church and then my father followed her into the church. I remember good times in the church, mostly being around uh, friends. Uh, I highlighted the musical parts, because I love music. And everything surrounding that, and our family, my family, sisters, brother, were in the musical realm. I've had my negative memories of it, and I have tried for so long to not allow it to overshadow the good. I was working um, for a department store and the pastor who had a church in that organization, the CLGI, he invited me to church. Eventually I went and he had a Bible study in his home or church in his home and I went with a friend of mine um, so we could be safe, you know, going to a church in a house was yes. weird for me at first. So I went and um, she went with me and it started there. And from that point on, I continued to go. I just simply wanted somebody to tell me the truth about God, about the Word of God, about Jesus, about this heaven, hell, and all of those things. But that's what, that's what really drew me in. I got the truth of the Word of God. Um, as I began to actually learn some scripture, then I came to realize that it wasn't my wife, it wasn't my children, it wasn't anybody else, but it was me mm. that needed some deep work. And through more inquiring with him about the scripture, I found out that there's only one person that could change me, mm. and that was the Lord. Well, my experience in Germany initially, it was a good experience, you know, I'd say for about the first two years there. There was a large group that was associated with the chapel system that moved off base. And the pastor who moved that group off base was, he received another assignment. And so in the process of having someone to oversee that work, this is when they assigned someone from the Church of the Living God International Pillar and Ground of Truth to come and pastor that church. During those first two years, it was good. I mean, you know, I was learning a whole lot. Um, I was really being fed biblically. I was becoming more satisfied spiritually and also growing. Where it went south was when that pastor that was assigned from that organization began to incorporate us 
and associate that work with the main organization. And I think that's when the transition from good to, well, this isn't, you know, feeling too good right about now. Very early on, you would have sermons about um, women who were dreaming about the pastor. We would see the young ladies, um, well, one in particular, go up to them and cry. It was like, oh, that's who he was talking about. Mm-hmm. So it really became like this game to us because we were new, mm-hmm. where we were trying to figure out, well, who's he talking about? It was a lot of Dr. White said, Dr. White said, or Bishop Lee said. There was a lot of human interpretation mm-hmm. mixed in. So here's how it all, made me stay, what made me join was I started thinking I need a firm, hard gospel because I am a hardcore bad person. I need somebody who's not going to sugarcoat. They didn't do that. I need somebody who's going to get in my face. They did that. I need somebody who's going to put some chains on me, so to speak. They did those things. And I just felt that it was the aggressive type of ministry that I needed at that time to get me back on track. I mean, as an independent pastor, I thought it was great. But when he had to give an account for the work and had to report to a structure, this is when he began to include the work under that reporting structure. And you know how it is when there is an established culture and everything is going well, you know, you, you love being there, just like with any other job. And then when another culture comes in and kind of dismantles the culture that you were used to functioning in, there's apprehension. Well, there were a couple of times we didn't make it out to service. We didn't have a problem with that. Mm -hmm. People would call us and say, hey, you weren't at church. And we were like, yeah, we're not at church. Yeah. Okay. So it almost became like quickly, it was like you were not supposed to miss church. The church schedule was (laughs) relentless. You had Christian education Sunday morning from 9, roughly ends right before 12, And then you had morning service from 12, and you're not out of church until around 3 (laughs) p.m. And then from 3 p.m. to roughly 6 p.m., you get a break, and then you come back for evening prayer. And then after evening prayer, you had youth service. And then youth service got out around 10 p.m., so that's Sunday. We did a lot of different things in the church. We were busy at Bible study, choir rehearsal, which choir rehearsal was actually fun to me. Then we had church. So I was in church. Because in my mind from the church, it's you cannot be a part of the world. So if I didn't have a lot of friends there, that meant I was doing a good job. Time was something that I saw very early on. And I had young kids. It would kind of get to me that we were in church so much. And not just so much, but so long. Tuesday night, we went two hours at least for, you know, a Bible study. Choir practice on Wednesday. Friday night was kind of like um, a free-for-all because after all, what are you going to do? Go home and just sit on the couch. See, things like this were said, and it would kind of hit you. It kind of like a drop. It's like, but wait a minute, did they just say that? And then it was always a, a, a double back to say, see, you hear that siren out there? It could have been you if you weren't in church, so the Lord protected you. You know, we're young. He went and talked with Bishop Lee. He's like, hey, we're newlyweds. What's going on? You know. <laughs> and I remember my husband coming to get me out of prayer. And he's like, well, um, Bishop Lee wants to talk to us. And we get in his office and he, you know, starts telling us, well, Brother Farmer's telling me, you know, you guys are going through a rough patch. And I mean, we hadn't even been, been married a year. And I was like, okay. And he opened his door. He's like, anytime you want to speak or talk, you know, feel free to come. He really started becoming like a, a father. Everybody was close. You were together every day. You were in church every day. See, when the Lord is moving, you don't, you don't watch clocks. A day to him is as a thousand years. Come on. You just can't take it because you really ain't saved. 
at the time we didn't have a lot of girls, but the, the, the people that we had, no matter what their age was, this was where I was supposed to be. Can't have communication with the world. Mm -hmm. April of 97, um, my grandmother passed away. That morning, um, William Lee called me down to pray for me. Mm -hmm. And he started ministering to me about how the Lord helped him through when his brother died. And I'm thinking, well, why is he telling me about his brother mm -hmm. when this is my grandmother that passed? Finally made it to the States. Um, we were getting ready to fly back to Germany. We couldn't get a hop and came back to Maryland from Philly. And that night my brother was killed. Mm -hmm. And so the very words that he gave me prior mm -hmm. to leaving about his brother, I needed for my family. And so we ended up staying in the States for a second funeral. Mm -hmm. And I think for me, that was a sign. That was, you know, that was, that was the law. And then I was there going home with my wife and she's in tears. She's a school teacher. You know why she's in tears? Because her babies had to get up and get ready and go to school the next day. But you know how the, I told you they always had a, um, a, a comeback. All our kids are on the honor roll, and they all do it. They've been doing this for years. Now I have to go to this man and say, uh, so that would be the first, you could say, scrape I had. It's like, um, sir, you know, my wife is really going through. My wife is in tears, and I've heard you say many times over the pulpit that you don't like when your wife's in tears. Well, if she needs to tip out, what else? she can just tip out. You know, but she, when she gets the spirit enough, and it would always come back to when you get the spirit enough. I know that what I experienced was real. I know that what I experienced was good. And so you hold on to that thinking that, okay, well, there's gotta be a turning point. There's got to be more of this good, more of this feeling full and satisfied, but it never happened. The saints, not Christians, the saints would all come from all around the country and in some some instances even get on planes from other countries and fly in because honestly even if the Lord was there that wasn't a big deal but if the Dr. Joseph White was there planes, trains, automobiles, wagons, whatever you had, mopeds, come on credit cards, get in debt, come on just make it happen. I drive up on a, on a Friday night after work mm -hmm. all night long driving get to the destination with my family. Now, it could be anywhere from Philadelphia to, we drove to Oklahoma City one time, we were, I mean, we could be Texas, we were anywhere that we had a church or a jurisdiction. And we would travel all night long, tell the family, y'all just need to be dressed. Cause you know, when we get off the road at six or seven in the morning, we ain't got time to be trying to mess with the hotel, find your bathroom, you can freshen it up, but we're gonna go straight in to the seminar because Joseph White, Dr. Joseph White is teaching. And you don't want to miss it. Now, mind you, you're driving seven, eight, five, three, what are you driving all night, worked all day? But it would come back to you because I have the Holy Ghost. I can do this. And because I have the Holy Ghost, I want other people with the Holy Ghost to see me. And I really want him to see me because I want approval. And then if I'm not there, what are people going to say? Well, he really don't have the spirit quite yet. The bishop of that organization, uh, he began to ask me, um, you know, well, what do you think about getting out of the Air Force and, you know, living with me and traveling with me, building up churches, starting churches, starting Bible studies. And so after about a, a year and a half, um, you know, I felt like I was on a roll with the church and with the Lord. And I said, you know what? Yeah, I think I... I think this is what, you know, the Lord is calling me to do, to um, get out of Uncle Sam's Air Force and work for the organization full time. He said, now, if you get out, <clears throat> I want you to understand that, you know, as long as I eat, you'll eat. Where I lay my head, you lay your head. Well, I came out with the understanding that, you know, although I wouldn't be living this lavish life or or you know going moving into a career field where i can further catapult into something greater i had that understanding because my gratification came out of working for the ministry seeing souls saved building up works
Dr. White was in town at our meeting in North Carolina, and some of the young men were just um, going to his room, and you know, I guess they were just, because parents would say, hey, you need to go be with Dr. White, he'll let you, then go be with him. Well, the word was getting out that he was running around in his drawers only. We have a bishop who is free, and he don't mean no harm. Bishop is just free with himself and free around others. He's so free that he'll walk around like that. Bishop is down earth. Mm-hmm. And I said, yeah, Bishop is down earth. Mm-hmm. That time was very frantic for me. Yeah. And being in a place where there is a pastor there that your parents love, you then become subject to what they like. Mm-hmm. I didn't and I feel, I felt like I lied for so many years because it was like, oh, I love them. I did not like, I, did, I didn't. It was, if you don't like them, you might get in trouble. And that was just, that was all around fear. And I remember when the, when I was molested, like, I remember running and not having a place to hide. How old were you? Five. When I got out of the service, it was on the heels of a scandal with the organization. And this was when the church was a part of that first organization, Church of the Living God, um, Pillar and Ground of Truth Without Controversy. And the scandal was that uh, Bishop White, who was the presiding bishop um, over our church, he um, you know, was accused of sexual misconduct. And um, this sexual misconduct with this young man, you know, he was accused of violating him. Now, to what degree, I didn't hear the details, but that was left up to the imagination. The bishop was brought before that board of bishops in that organization. They pretty much said, well, this is what you're being accused of. How do you answer to this? From my understanding and through what was said historically, he didn't answer anything regarding those charges. Long story short, they defrocked him of his bishopric, but he came back and told the organization that these were nothing but lies. He's coming up under false accusations. And so in an effort to continue to um, operate as the presiding bishop of of, of the church, he was left with no other choice but to start his own organization and that happened as I was transitioning out of the Air Force and moving to Columbus Ohio to work for the organization it was a um, very cunning way they had of teaching you to love this man heck or high water but when you get the bylaws and you start to read them for yourself you will see uh, very early on in the bylaws, it states each church leader will teach the members how to love the presiding bishop. But you know what? And it worked on me. When that happened, you know, I was I was told by my pastor in Germany, okay, Elder Ocampo, when you get out, I want you to understand that when you move to Columbus, there are going to be a whole lot of people saying a whole lot of things about Bishop White, but I want you to know that none of those things are true. But, you know, in my mind, you know, I, I rested with that because to me, this was a man that preached the gospel to me. I got saved, had the genuine, genuine experience with the Lord. I said, okay, I can trust him. And so I left with that trust. I had that trust in my heart, in my mind, I knew that no matter what was spoken about regarding Bishop White, I would be okay because I wouldn't believe it. Because I heard from a a credible man of God that Bishop White could not be these things. They said there was another man who said that Dr. White was gay. They said this man ended up in jail. And you know how the story goes, he was gay. And he was the one that had sexual issues. Not Dr. White, but the Lord punished him. Because we are special to God. These people are, you know, trying to tear down our pastor, our bishop, you know. They would always say, if you smite the shepherd, the sheep go astray. So that was kind of the scripture to bring us in. Like, don't allow 
these people to smite the shepherd. If they can get him, then where will we be? So we went into protective mode. Because I worked on the military base, I would come to the church for noonday prayer. I would always stick my head in and speak to Bishop Lee. Mm -hmm. And so as I started doing this, he would say, well, come on in and talk to me. And so we, I would just talk, and he would kind of ask me about myself and ask me about my husband. And so eventually he started saying, he would call me Dr. Farmer, and he just kept saying, you, you like preachers, you like strong men. And I said, okay, so finally one day, and I don't know how long this took, this was about 97, he said, come on, Dr. Farmer, who does that sound like? And I said, you? And he looked at me, he said, and I asked him, how do I go free? He said, no, no, Dr. Farmer, you too deep. You can't go free from this. Mm -hmm. And I said, but how did that happen? Oh, you just need to calm down, calm down. You didn't do anything wrong. And he would start, because I started playing the, the organ, mm -hmm. he started talking to me in terms of music. And he said, you just need to learn you just need to learn how to transpose into the key of your husband. So when I'm with my husband, he's, he, he's on my mind, but I have to transpose it. And that was 97. We didn't leave Germany until 2002. And I never told anybody because I was so ashamed. And I felt like I betrayed my husband. Mm -hmm. And it was so demeaning. And it was devaluing. It was like he took joy mm -hmm. in thinking that he was the catalyst for that. Mm -hmm. And my husband was just there. I buried the fact that I was molested by the pastor's son. I've come to know that he was 15. Mm -hmm. Something that for the, a long period of time I felt Maybe they didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Maybe, maybe I remembered it wrong. We would work with people that we trusted, and from that point, I did not trust them. He he touched me in inappropriate ways he shouldn't have, and he made me perform oral sex on him. That when you're a child, you don't know what's right or what's wrong. It, that it's not coming to you. You, it's something happening, and you don't know why it doesn't feel right yeah. at that time. We were in this condominium, and it was I hadn't even been there a whole month yet, so I stayed in the guest room. It was a day bed. It was a small day bed, around twin size. And I remember uh, laying down, I had slept, and during, you know, one of those mornings, Bishop White comes into the room and lays down next to me. I'm facing the wall on the day bed, so he comes and lays down next to me in such a way to where his front side is pressed up against my back side. And in my mind, alarms were going off. I was like a deer in headlights. In my mind, I began to say, is this man doing what I think he's doing? And you know, especially on the heels of the first accusation, that's all I can think about. And then, I, and then what went through my head was, you know, what my pastor told me, if you hear these things, don't <laughs> believe them. He is not that way. So I'm wrestling with this. He is not that way. But then I can't help but feel this is that way. Because then he starts embracing me. And then he starts caressing me. Next thing you know, he's groping me and moves his hands, you know, in my genital area, on my genitals. At that point, you know, I kind of snapped out of the deer in headlights. And I jumped out of the bed and rushed to the bathroom. And I remember shutting the door and locking it. And in my mind, I'm saying, what did I get myself into? And so I'm wrestling with these thoughts. 
trying to figure out how to reconcile what my pastor told me and what he just did. You know, and so I said to myself, okay, is the devil fighting me? What? I said, no, but, you know, nature kicked in. I said, I'm only going to come when I'm called and speak when I'm spoken to. I'm not going to give this man any uh, interaction to where there would be a necessity to be relational. In my mind, I settled it, and I said, I'm here to work for the organization. I'm not here to be whatever it is he thinks I'm here for. And so that's what I did. Um, in order to survive amidst that, I kind of secluded myself. We had the clearest view of the gospel. We had the clearest view of God. And oh my goodness, Dr. White has seen God face to face. Everyone was rallying for him. And everyone was saying, no, he is not like that. Mm -hmm. No, he is a man of God. Mm -hmm. No, he is, you know, he is the closest thing to Jesus. <sighs> For me, that put me in a, in, in a bad spot because now I'm saying to myself, okay, I can't speak to anyone now because the entire new organization that he formed is rallying to his side. And for me to speak up mm -hmm. would mean that I'm the enemy now. When I found out that I was pregnant, I was so excited. And I remember getting to prayer that evening. And I went and I told him. Throughout my pregnancy, um, he would say things over the pulpit. Well, we, we got to see how Farmer does when she had this baby. And because, um, you know, she'll make it here, little God. That baby will be a God. And you know, she'll make it a God. It just kept going. Mm -hmm. This baby was going to be my God. And when my son was born, I was so careful because I didn't want him to be my God. And even though I was loving towards him, I was not very, um, I did not embrace him mm -hmm. like a first time mother should be, should have done. Mm -hmm. And even when I went to the board in 2008 and I reported this, mm -hmm. I told him this. I said, he took that from me. As a mother, mm -hmm. he took that from me. And so now my son is 18. Yes. And I probably, probably maybe the last three years, mm -hmm. I tried to get that time back. But because you're at a, you had a different season and time and, he knows that I love him, but that's the one thing that I know I would never get back. I wrestled with going back home to be with my family. I think it was a prideful or reputational type. It was embarrassing. Prior to moving to Columbus, Ohio, to work for the organization, I went home for 30 days. And so my family's like, oh, so you're out of the military. What do you have plans to do? So I'm over here pumping it up. You know, I'm, I'm going to be traveling the world. I'm going to be building up organizations. I'm going to be building up churches. I'm going to be traveling all over the place. But what are you getting paid? It's all voluntary, and this yeah. is this is what's gratifying yeah. to me. You know, this is something I want to do. It's Don't gratifying. It. It's spiritual. You know, this that, and the other. And so, I remember speaking to one of my uncles, and he was like, "Well, you know, I guess it's gratifying for you." Yes. So I was facing shame on one end, persecution on another, mm -hmm. and so for me, my best option is to hang tight, come when called, speak when spoken to. I was afraid of their mom. Yeah. And, um, you know, she used to hate me. She's too, she used to make me afraid of her physically. She was a lot bigger than I was. And she was very mean to me. But when my parents were around, she wasn't mean to me. Was there anyone that you felt safe with in the church? Or any of your family? Any of family? Probably my parents. Your parents. parents. And they didn't know. They didn't know. And I didn't tell them. Yeah, because I, I felt yeah. like I would get in trouble if they knew. Yeah. I have someone that's already hitting me, and I'm feeling you, they've left me in the authority of you. Mm -hmm. And if your parents leave you with someone, you have to listen. Yes. 
you have to, you have to do what you do. Yeah. Let's just pause. Let's pause. Yeah. There would be times where we would travel to different churches, and he would often bring up the fact that, well, Elder Ocampo hugs the other brothers, but he doesn't hug me, you know, things of that nature. So he was noticing Your things like that, and, others. And, and even more so whenever I went to Germany because I considered, you know, Bishop Lee at the time to be my father in the gospel. So, you know, I, I held that man in high esteem and I was always right there wherever, wherever he was. And so I knew he didn't like that, you know, but I didn't do it because I knew he didn't like that. But he, he made it known that he didn't like that. And Bishop White had this, I would say it was a sick affection toward me. He was always, you know, sewing in, um, my relationship with her into his message <laughs> and so it was like this subtle discrediting of me before the people everywhere we went and me because he he did me to be the whore right and so <laughs> because we were an international organization when we went to europe it was sown in europe when we went to south america it was sown in south america so everyone would look at me with eyes of shame you know, that's that's really a shame, Elder Campbell, that you really stooped this low. How could you? You're with this man of God. And what he displayed toward me was kind of like jealousy or whatever. Sure and when was. we started dating, that's when it went awry. We left Germany in 20, 2002. We were in Valdosta mm -hmm. for three years. My husband went to Korea. And in 2005, I happened to be talking to my friend, the one who brought me to the church. Mm -hmm. And she made a comment about something similar. And that's the first person I told. Mm -hmm. And that night, it was a Sunday, that night I went to, to service mm -hmm. and I pulled my pastor, new pastor was Bishop Smith, who mm -hmm. also came from Germany. And I walked up to him and I told him. And he looked at me and he said, Sister Farmer, you're just one of many women that he's done that to. And that was it. Because he has a sister who was all also a bishop in his organization. Her name is Martha Edwards. Okay. And she she's in the Atlanta area. Whenever I would come see her, you know, just out of respect since I was living with a man, he suggested that I stay with her whenever I came to visit my fiance. That didn't work out too well. Because when I went to visit one time, I remember staying with Bishop Edwards. And I remember coming home at, you know, to her home at 10 p.m. I'm knocking on the door. We're, we're calling, we're knocking. No one answers the door or anything. I, they lock me out of the house. And for me, because I know how they operate, it was, it was so that they could set up a scenario where I had been out all night long and fornicated with my okay. fiance. <laughs> it didn't go down like that because, you know, after we, you know, they wouldn't let me in. Um, I had um, Portia take me to a hotel, which wasn't far away. So I stayed in a hotel. I called Bishop Edwards up and let her and Brother John know that that's where I was because no one would let me in. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was it was crazy. Some of the things that they would do to try to separate us. I mean, I, I can go on and on, but I know where I can. <laughs> Joseph White walked out of a, of a seminar. He walked right over to me. He's a tall man. And he said, Farmer, you just need to move on. In him you live, move, and have your being, and let the past be the past. And I just remember feeling horrible, like I did something, and powerless. And I just moved on. I literally moved on. In February 2006, my husband came on, on to Florida on his mentor. And Bishop Smith came up to me out of nowhere, hadn't talked about it, hadn't bought it up, mm -hmm. hadn't even told my husband. 
And Bishop Smith walked up to me before the start of um, his anniversary. And he said, Bishop White said, you need to tell your husband. And I said, tell him what? He said, what, what happened to you? Mm -hmm. And I said, absolutely not. I can't tell him that. He said, well, he said you need to tell him. And that night after service, and I sat and I told him everything. All of the conversations. The look on his face was just, it was horrible. And I didn't know if his look was anger at me. Mm -hmm. Was it anger at the leaders? Mm -hmm. was, he, was he hurt himself? how he felt as a man, I didn't know. And the amazing thing is, I think the next night, I probably did praise and worship or he did praise and worship. And you just moved on. But you move on, but you're still so broken. And I didn't understand if you wanted me to tell him, there was no help for me, there was no help for my marriage, there was so much that was taken from our marriage. We were four months married for four months when we first came in. At this time, we had now been married almost 10, ten years. years. And so going through all of that with Bishop Lee, there were times where I did not want to be intimate with my husband because I felt guilty. How can I be intimate with my husband? And the, the crazy thing is, I knew I wasn't in love with him. Mm -hmm. This was like a father. This man, when we left to go to, to Maryland when my grandmother died, my paycheck hadn't come. He went in his pocket and gave us $500 mm -hmm. so we could fly to the States. And I felt horrible. I just felt horrible. You know, they would come and say, well, you know, pretty much we weren't meant to be together. You know, I work for the organization. She's new to the organization. So we're at different levels than you, you two. We're not I, yoked. I, yeah, we're, we're not equally yoked. And mm -hmm. so we shouldn't be together. Yeah. I mean, he went so far as to go to my, mm -hmm. my family in San Diego and tell them that because we weren't of the same race that it wouldn't work. Yeah. You know, and that my family needs to intervene yeah. and end stop it. the marriage, end end break the engagement up. He did a lot of brainwashing. Mm -hmm. He did. He told me that he would not be able to provide things like that. And it would make me afraid afraid. Like will he will he be able to provide you know, you second guess everything because of what he what he said to me and he was um, very disrespectful on on him as a person, his body and things like that. He would talk to me about things like inappropriate things. He would say to me about our sexual life, what it would be like. Um, he, he spoke to me about that before we got married. He told me that my husband would not be able to satisfy me, things like that. So he would, he would say those things to me privately to put fear in me before we got married. Mary Butler, Mary Butler, who is the sister of the founder, became my jurisdictional bishop. And when even when I was drinking the proverbial Kool-Aid, we all have faults, but I was starting to see how mean, a mean woman, um, very controlling woman. Her number one word was obedient. Hey, yep, you're so obedient. All you have to do is, you know, I smile at people, I treat everybody nice. But then get behind those closed doors and those horns went up. Talked about some people that I really regarded highly. And it was kind of working there for a minute where she was shaping my mind on how I should view people. So immediately when I broke away from this thing, I said never again will anybody shape my mind about how to feel about somebody else. On the day of the wedding, I think was most detrimental, but he was so abusive all the way up to the wedding. Um, it was it was just stressful. And he would do that at church. You know, have women come up and say, I have a niece or I have a friend that you should go meet today after lunch in my face. 
it was a missionary <clears throat> conference here in Atlanta. It was Elder Austin. She came down. Um, I was in the ladies' room, and I went to the ladies' room because I knew what was coming. <laughs> I went to, <laughs> to get away, to get out of the sanctuary because I knew she was going to say something to me. They sent ushers to get me. So we went to the restroom. me she called me down and she wanted to let me know that I wasn't worthy so she said to me um, when I got down there that El Ocampo is way up here and you you're way down here she did the demonstration in front of the congregation. She did it to humiliate me. And she did. So she told me how um, loose of a woman I was, you know, and how I shouldn't have, I shouldn't be with someone like him and leave with my dignity is what she said. And then she said she wanted to pray for me. So she laid hands on me. She prayed for me. I mean, I don't want her praying for me. I don't want her touching me. But we were already in it. Everybody's looking. If I walked off, then I'm going to look like what she said I was. If I said something, I prove a point. So you're stuck. Uh, so she, she prayed for me. And I can remember, you know, praying. Like, Lord, get me out of this with her. And I felt like it was the longest prayer of my life. <laughs> and then when she was done, she said, you can just go back to your seat. And she did me like this. You just go back to your seat. Uh, so it was quiet. You know, so you know, I, I felt like fainting, you know, being dizzy. I just remember it like that. So I just went and sat down and, you know, kept my head down. And my friend, she was like, it's going to be okay. And that was just it. Final straw was when I was told I would be cursed in 30 days if I left this church. He said, for all of you who will stand with the church of the living God, don't rhyme with it, don't reason with it, don't chide with it. He said, but if you will stand with the church of the living God, he said, I'm going to bless you within 30 days. For all who do not, he said, I'm going to curse you within 30 days. When it actually took place, I was in shock that Mary Butler got up and said to everyone that was there, you will be cursed in 30 days if you leave this church. Come to the altar right now if you don't want that curse to befall you or something to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, uh, so I looked at my wife. She looked at me. I looked back and there were a few other strong individuals at that time. It was like, well, I got one better. I'm not going up to the altar. I'm going out that door. For me, the straw that broke the camel's back, the obvious cover-up and protection of Joseph White, mm -hmm. it was at this point, our eyes came open and it was, we, we had to get out. Mm -hmm. Our pastor knew it and honestly failed to take action. And so the Lord was showing me today, he said, and no matter what law may pass, no matter what decision people may make, he said, none of those laws can govern you because you are in the spirit. Going through 21 years of substandard leadership, you know, as a result of what my wife had said earlier, mm -hmm. um, and even in that, I felt like I had failed to protect her and my family. When the news story broke, I think the TV station out of Cleveland did the mm -hmm. story, yeah. and they had the video of Joseph White and the reporter, mm -hmm. and he was closing that door. Mm -hmm. I, I knew then 
it, it was time. We reached out to Bishop White, who lives here in suburban Columbus. We emailed him and we called him five times asking him to respond to the allegations. The bishop never responded. Tom Meyer with Channel 3 News in Cleveland. But we here. caught up with him as he pulled into the church parking lot in his Mercedes. Some former church members, including minors, I want to have accused you. you. Bishop White. Bishop White. Please. Bishop White, just want to ask you about allegations that are being made against you. They're not true. They're not true? Can you elaborate? White may have denied the allegations, but he had no interest in talking about them. Victims tell me that you spent a lot of time grooming them to become sexually intimate, Bishop. They were like zombies. They ran up to the altar and it was like, my God, this is so sad. You know what I really hearkened back to was the account of Jim Jones. And I am dead serious. Had there been some Kool-Aid up there, poison, and they'd have said, we that are Holy Ghost filled are all into this church because God is with this church. And you know, you need to drink this Kool-Aid because we just, we just tired of all this. It's time to go home because that man, Joseph White, said it's time to go. There would have been some dead people in uh, uh, Mobile, Alabama. A whole lot of dead people. The back of the camel that broke <laughs> that separated me from Bishop Joseph White. Was, he was after a Bible study. He was just screaming and saying it was all my fault and I need to leave. And right. you go home and you go home, you shouldn't be here. This is what he was screaming to me because we were together. I'm gonna bring him down. I know how to bring him down low. And that's what he told, so he threatened me. He said, if I didn't leave him alone, he will ruin him, is what he said to me. Elder Garcia, who stayed with the bishop as well at the time I was there, he took me to go get the U-Haul truck. I get the U-Haul truck, I pack it up. You know, no doubt Bishop White in his mind is doesn't know what's going on. So when I finally just left and, you know, went about my merry way, you know, he was he was dumbfounded. It was important for him for members of the church to be there. It wasn't important to me anymore because all the members of the church were nasty to me. So I didn't really want any of the members there other than my local church and my best friend, who was the Russell, Christiana Russell, and he knew if he can get to her, he could hurt me, and he used her to, to hurt me. Hours before our wedding, she called me crying, and she said that he told her she could not be my um, maid of honor. All up until then, she was a part of everything, but he knew if he told her that, that she wouldn't, and he said, she told me that he would sit her down and take her license if she supported us. So she could not support us. But, yeah, but in addition to that, you know, everyone that I was expecting, you know, um, my father in the gospel in Europe, I, I caught wind that he was flying all the way from Europe, as well as some of the other brothers and sisters from Europe to attend our wedding. You know, Bishop White, put the word out and said if anyone attends our wedding they would lose their license they would lose their licenses mm -hmm. that's when you know bishop lee and whoever else came from europe to attend our wedding that's when they decided to do other things within the organization like visit some of the other churches and yeah. run, run revivals so at the, the venues other churches. that we purchase right. was no longer you know accommodative because the size what who what we were expecting right he had uh changed all of that. I got a call from Mary Butler, who's mm -hmm. also one of the bishops. Oh yes, yes. And she happened to call me on my personal cell, but I had my husband on my work cell. Mm -hmm. So I put her through the Bluetooth so he could hear the conversation. It blew my mind and she said, you know, um, um, I don't know what you wanted us to do, all people run around saying all of this happened and so on and so forth. And I said, but Bishop Butler, you told me yourself 10 years ago that the lawyers recommended removal for Bishop Lee and Bishop Smith. And these are the same lawyers. So I find it difficult to believe that they didn't recommend removal of Joseph White. Went through all of that. Um, she said some things, threw everyone on the board under the bus. She sure did. Absolutely everyone under the bus. So I've never heard anybody say, you know what, um, hey, we understand it's just not working out for you, but there's many churches out there. Mm -hmm. Go on. 
you know, try somebody else, God speed to you. That's never going to happen. So if you were to be in that and you left today, you'd be mud tomorrow. You know, we kind of lost a lot of money, you know, um, paying for venues and things like that and and food to accommodate people who just no-showed. So he wanted that. He wanted those people to no-show on the day of our wedding. So that was his way of communicating to us, I still have control here. So he pulled my best friend, and then he drastically changed the number of people that we were expecting so we would remember that, that moment. And we did. Right after Father's Day, we were sitting at dinner, mm -hmm. and we received a text from the pastor again. And this time he um, put his wife on the text, and um, that said, I'm hearing some news about you all, and and I hate and I hate to believe it, but I don't understand. When you all left, you said that you were not interested in tearing down the church, mm -hmm. but you all are inviting people to the movies, which we didn't. Mm -hmm. My husband was telling another elder's husband who was not in the church mm -hmm. about the church, mm -hmm. about what was going mm -hmm. on, which is all public record is on the internet. Yeah. My husband was encouraging young people not to live holy, which we have teenage sons, so why would we do that? And the saints just want you to leave them alone. We had not contacted anyone. We had been in the church almost 22 years, mm -hmm. and we understood what happens when you leave. And so we did not reach out to anyone. We had people from the local church reaching out to us mm -hmm. and expressing their concerns. And we talked them through it. Yeah. 2015, he sent me a message on Facebook. It literally said, uh, hello to me. And every, everything that I felt might have been a fragment of, of, of my imagination, it, it came back and I was angry. I was so angry that I, I wrote him back to let him know, I remember everything you did. And you you took something that didn't belong to you. And you had no care for my feelings. And I told him I hated him. And that I had no desire to break up his family, but that I just wanted him to know that I remember everything he did. He did. You took innocence that it was mine. Yeah. It was yours. And um, his response was, I understand I won't contact you anymore. There was no I'm sorry. There was no, I realized what I did was wrong. None of that. And that infuriated me even more. My mother did reach out to get answers mm -hmm. for that. She initially wanted to speak with his mother, elderly, but she, she passed. She spoke with his father, and I don't know exactly the words, but it was, it, to paraphrase, was, well, she's not saved, he's not saved, and you know, he uh, allegedly, he's all, he was on drugs. And I took it as there was nothing to be done for me. There was no acknowledgement that it happened. Not even to me. And the fact that if I don't have to be saved for you to realize that you, you violated me. And even if you can't speak to your son, it's okay to say, I apologize yeah. for that happening. It would have been nice, but it infuriated me even more because it made me feel like they were only protecting themselves. And being afraid to say that was even worse to the people that cared about me the most, which was my mother and father. Yeah. And knowing that there won't be answers for that, it, it, it made me feel like I couldn't trust people or trust the church mm -hmm. because if I bring if I bring something to you from my heart from something that happened and you turn me away you're supposed to be a safe place in the church if you have a fault with anyone you're supposed to address that and that wasn't done
it sounds crazy, but I literally had PTSD when it came to seeing a black person pick up a microphone. I, I just did not want to, I didn't want anything to do with it. But I was so afraid because it's all I knew. And there was such a fear put in you about God and yes. what would he do. Yes. But for some reason, it, I couldn't, it's like I could not leave God alone. So I just learned to put church aside mm -hmm. and learn him mm -hmm. and work on my relationship with him. So this CLGI cult really impacted me personally, it impacted my family, my extended family, my children. I mean, every waking moment was governed by this CLGI, and, and it had deep roots in me. But that really hurt, and I had to go back when I when I got free and make it right as much as I could, and apologize to my mother, my children, my wife, everybody, whether they wanted an apology or not. It's all about finding the balance in my life for me. Those things, I, I can't get them back. So it is finding the balance to learn how to be happy and grateful for what I do have, for what I can aspire to do. A lot of emotions for me are, are all over the place. I have never followed through with being open and honest about things that have happened to me. I'm going in a new direction in, in, in life and I'm excited about it. There is liberty. I'm so grateful for liberty. I'm so grateful for freedom. Yes. I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be in this setting, to be able, even for others, to be able to speak for others, mm -hmm. that this will help them. You no longer have to be afraid. You don't have to be afraid. Because our God, he's not a God of fear. He's a God truly of love, and he loves me. That was stress. Because mm -hmm. we gotta get there, we gotta eat. Come on, you ain't done yet, pack up, let's go. Come on, I gotta get the prep, come on, let's go. Now, we're on our time. And that's how God wants it, because the first ministry is the family. Life after the cult um, is, is better. He, I've learned how to treat people and how not to treat people. Um, that's my takeaway, that you don't overstep a person's will and that you need to respect others' decisions and their choices, even if they're not like yours. Boundaries yeah, and, and, and how healthy boundaries are. And it's okay to have them, even with a pastor. Yeah. As a lay member, as a church member, you can have boundaries with your pastor and still have a decent, respectable relationship with them. You know, it's not about my kingdom. It's not, and, and what I learned was that if you're a leader and you begin to treat the work like your kingdom, then you're going to maneuver everyone like their pieces on the chessboard. But if all souls belong to God, then you have to even as a leader seek God on how to counsel, how to direct, how to treat them, how to treat people, how to love them. Marriage has been wonderful, you know, <laughs> once, once, you know, because we would take counsel with each other, we would talk these things out. Yeah. We would share with each other what it was that Bishop told me separately yeah. to sow discord with her, and she yeah. would share with me what Bishop told her separately to yeah. sow discord with us. And then we would talk these things out, and then look, and then we would look at the organization God has blessed us with, yeah. and then we would learn and, and adjust all of that because we know we can't control the will of people. And ministry begins at home. And ministry begins at home. <laughs> so we've been happy. We've been blessed. Yeah. Um, I no longer live life from a $400 a month standpoint. <laughs> <laughs> God is true to his word. He is. He has blessed he us exceedingly abundantly yes, yes. above all that we're able to ask or think. Yes.